All right, happy Monday, everybody. It's time for Devotionals with Daniel, and welcome uh, again. Thank you for tuning in. Okay, uh, let me just give you a little bit of a background of where we were last week so we can move ahead and talk about this week. So last week we talked about a, a new character that we met. His name is Balaam. Now, Balaam is a Harry Potter type sorcerer. Uh, you know, he, he's a diviner. He is a, you know, does pagan sorcery. He is not a believer. He's not an Israelite. He does not follow God or worship him on the regular basis that we know of here in the Bible. However, what has happened is a king, Balak, Balaam and Balak, like, thank you for those two names that are almost identical. Uh, Balak, the king of Moab, has become extremely scared about the Israelites. The Israelites have started moving into surrounding territories, conquering them and destroying them and settling in their lands. And they're all moving into these areas. And, and King Balak is right here going, oh my gosh, I am next. Okay, so, uh, you know, I'm scared for my life. I'm scared for Moab. And so he sends a bunch of people to go get Balaam because Balaam is a known sorcerer. And he says, go get Balaam and tell him to come back here and put a curse on these Israelites because I can't defeat them otherwise. They're going to wipe us out. So the people go. They ask him to come. He prays about it all night, meets with God, and God says, no, you can't go. So then they come back again and they say, please, 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 please come and put a curse on them. And so Balaam prays again and talks to God. God, surprisingly, is meeting up with him and talking back to Balaam this uh you know pagan sorcerer and uh, says okay you can go with them but only if you do what i tell you to do then we have the whole donkey talks to balaam part of the story which is which is awesome and crazy and uh as they as they're traveling to meet with the king of moab and then there's he, you know a big angel that appears to balaam and again reinforces what god told him and says listen i was i would kill you um i almost killed you but here's the deal you have to do exactly what God says. You cannot just do whatever you want to do. You know, you cannot just say whatever. You have to say only the words I put in your mouth. So Balaam says, okay. And then he shows up to meet with the king of, of Moab, Balak, and says, hey, right up front, I want to tell you, I am here because you asked me to come, but I can only say what God puts in my mouth. I'm just going to tell you right up front. That's all I can do. I can't just come up and, and, and do whatever you want. I can only do what God tells me to do. So they go up to a mountain. They make a bunch of sacrifices. And Balaam uh, uh, utters his first oracle. And his oracle basically, instead of cursing Israel, blesses Israel. And uh, that's where we kind of left off at the end of that oracle where uh, Balak goes, what in the world are you saying? I asked you to come and curse Israel and you have just blessed them. And Balaam is like in chapter 23, verse 12, listen, I can only speak what God puts into my mouth. And I already told you that right up front, right? So, and this is where we pick up. Now, if you are in your Bible, turn with me to Numbers 23 and we're at verse 13. This is called Balaam's second oracle. Something of note that I read, <clears throat> there's nothing else in the Bible called oracles. Um, these are like prophecies, oops, these are like prophecies, but Balaam is not a prophet. So they're not stated as, or called prophecies. Uh, Balaam is, is a pagan diviner. So there's like a special term that they came up just for these like prophecies of Balaam. They're called oracles. So there you go. Balaam's second oracle. Then Balak, the king of Moab said to Balaam, come with me to another place where you can see them meaning the Israelites, and from there cursed them for me. So he took them up uh, to the field of Zophim, at the top of Pisgah, and there he built seven altars and offered a bull and a ram on each altar. So he's like, okay, well, if this place doesn't really work out for us and you can't curse them from here, then I guess we'll just go up a little higher and maybe you can see more people or curse them from a different location. So they make a trek up the hill with all their people, all their whole entourage, and build more altars and more bowls and 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 they sacrifice more animals verse 15 Balaam says to Balak stay here beside your offering while I meet with him over there verse 16 the Lord met with Balaam again and put a message in his mouth and said go back to Balak and give him this message 
So he went back uh, to him and found him standing beside his offering with the princes of Moab. Balak asked him, what did the Lord say? Then he uttered this oracle. So Balaam's going to say now what the Lord said. Arise, Balak, and listen. Hear me, son of Zippor. God is not a man that he should lie, nor a son of man that he should change his mind. Does he not speak? Oh, excuse me. Does he speak and then not act? Does he promise and not fulfill? I have received a command to bless. He has blessed, and I cannot change it. Okay. No misfortune is seen in Jacob, no misery observed in Israel. The Lord their God is with them. The shout of the king is among them. God brought them out of Egypt. They have the strength of a wild ox. There is no sorcery against Jacob, no divination against Israel. And it will now be said of Jacob and Israel, see what God has done. The people rise like a lioness. They rouse themselves like a lion that does not rest till he devours his prey and drinks the blood of his victims. Then Balak said to Balaam, neither curse them at all nor bless them at all. Balaam answered, did I not tell you what I must do whatever the Lord says? Here in this second oracle, I think he, he lays it out even worse for, for, uh, for Balak and the king of Moab. He says, listen, I cannot curse these people. I cannot do anything. God has already blessed them. What it says in, in uh, 20 is he has blessed. That means God in the past has already blessed and I cannot change it. So Balaam is, Balaam's like, listen, no matter of sorcery can change the fact that God has blessed these people. I cannot undo what God has done. I can't change it. I can't make it anything else. There's no changing this blessing that God in the past has already made uh, and, and, and spoken over Israel. The Lord their God is with them. Okay? And now, and then he says, like, they're super strong, they're rising like a lioness, they're going to just devour everything and just kill everybody, you know, like, a, like an animal, they're going to destroy and kill everybody. And, and Balak is like, what? You know, come on, man. Um, you know, and then in uh, verse 27, we'll move on here. Balak says to Balaam, come, let me take you to another place. Maybe if this place doesn't work and the first place doesn't work, let's go find another place to, to make some sacrifices and you can tell me what you see over there. Uh, perhaps it will please God to let you curse them for me from there. <laughs> and Balak took Balaam to the top of Peor, overlooking the wasteland. Balaam said, build me seven altars here and prepare seven bulls and seven rams. Balak did as Balaam had said and offered a bull and a ram on each altar. Now when Balaam saw that it pleased the Lord to bless Israel, he did not resort to sorcery as at other times, but turned his face toward the desert. When Balaam looked out and saw Israel encamped tribe by tribe, the Spirit of God came upon him, and he uttered his oracle. You guys, this is so interesting because now the Spirit of God is coming upon Balaam, a pagan worshiper, a sorcerer, a, a person who does not even barely know God, but for this interaction that we know of, and I don't think he's even, he's only spoken of one other little verse later on in the Bible, and this is his whole full story, um, that, that he is a pagan wor uh, worshiper that God's spirit is now resting upon. God's using him to accomplish God's purposes. That's just so cool and so interesting. Okay, so spirit of God came upon him and he uttered this oracle. We're in chapter 24 now, by the way. <clears throat> the oracle of Balaam, son of Beor, the oracle of one who eyes, whose eyes sees clearly, the oracle of one who hears the words of God, who sees a vision from the Almighty, who falls prostrate, and whose eyes are opened. This seems to be a big deal. We've talked about the Lord opening Balaam's eyes in the previous chapter. We talked about the Lord opening the mouth of the donkey, right? This is, um, this is, Balaam, whose eyes are open, verse 5 of 24. How beautiful are your tents, O Jacob, your dwelling places, O Israel. Like valleys they spread out, like gardens beside a river, like aloes planted by the Lord, like cedars beside the waters. Water will flow from their buckets. Their seed will have abundant water. More blessing here. Their king will be greater than Agag. Their kingdom will be exalted. God brought them out of Egypt. They have the strength of a wild ox. They devour hostile nations and break their bones in pieces. And with arrows, they pierce them. Like a lion, they crouch and lie down. Like a lioness who dares to rouse them. 
May those who bless you be blessed, and those who curse you be cursed. Another blessing for Israel, because what else can Balaam do, right? And the Spirit of God has come upon him to say these things. So now, in verse 10, let's read what happens here. Then Balak, the king of Moab, then Balak's anger burned against Balaam. He struck his hands together, or I don't know. He struck his hands together and said to him in anger, he's so mad, I summoned you to curse my enemies, but you have blessed them these three times. Now leave at once and go home. I said I would reward you handsomely, but the Lord has kept you from being rewarded. You ever heard something like that? I was going to pay you for this job, but you messed it up, so get out of here. You know, I'm not paying you anymore. Uh, and now he's blaming God. You know, the Lord has kept you from getting a reward. In verse 12, Balaam answered Balak, Listen, man, did I not tell the messengers you sent me, even at the very beginning? Did I not tell you, even if you gave me your palace filled with silver and gold, I could not do anything of my own accord, good or bad, to go beyond the command of the Lord. And I must say only what the Lord says. Now I'm going back to my own people, but come, let me warn you of what this people will do to your people in the days to come. So he's like, okay, listen, I told you right from the start, I, I couldn't do anything to, to curse these people. I can only do what God tells me to do. And now let me just tell you what's up. The fourth and, and final oracle from Balaam. Then he uttered this oracle. Verse 15, the oracle of Balaam, son of Baor, the oracle of one whose eyes see clearly, the oracle of one who hears the words of God, who has knowledge from the Most High, who sees a vision from the Almighty, who falls prostrate and whose eyes are opened. I see him, but not now. I behold him, but not near. A star will come out of Jacob. A scepter will rise out of Israel. He will crush the foreheads of Moab and the skulls of all the sons of Sheth. Edom will be conquered. Seir, his enemy, will be conquered. But Israel will grow strong. A ruler will come out of it, Jacob, and destroy the survivors of the city. Even worse, man, he's getting even worse. He, he says, a, a scepter will rise and crush the foreheads of Moab. That's, that's hurtful. <laughs> the king will be like, hey, man, now you're talking directly about us. So then Balaam saw Amalek and uttered his oracle. Amalek was the first among the nations, but he will come to ruin at last. Then he saw the, Ken the Kenites and uttered his oracle. Your dwelling place is secure. Your nest is set in a rock, but you Kenites will be destroyed when Ashur takes you captive. Then he uttered this oracle. Ah, who can live when God does this? Ships will come from the shores of Kittim. They will subdue Ashur and Aver. They will too come to ruin. Then Balaam got up and returned home, and Balak went on his own way. So... That's the kind of the end of that story. It's funny how, you know, they had that confrontation and Balak is like, listen, I, I, get out of here. Like you were supposed to, I hired you to do a job and you have totally blown it and I'm not going to pay you. And Balaam was like, well, well, fine then. Let's, let's talk about what else is going to happen. Let's see what God's going to do. He's going to destroy you. He's going to destroy this person. He's going to destroy this country. He's going to destroy all your friends. And he's going to crush you under his feet. And like you're just going to be demolished and destroyed. How about that? And adios. You know, and he takes off. So <laughs> the final blow. Um, but but uh, here's what I love about this. Uh, right? Balaam followed God even when it hurt. And I know that Balaam walked into this job. Let's, we can call it a job because he was hired to do a job. He was hired by the king to curse Israel. Balaam walked into this job knowing, like, I'm not going to be able to do this because I'm just going to tell you right up front, like, I'm, I'm not allowed to do anything but what God tells me to do. And um, and then every single time that, that Balaam gives another oracle, you know, you can tell that the king of Moab, Balak, is frustrated. He goes, okay, well... I asked you to curse them, but you're blessing them. So uh, let's try again. Let's go somewhere else and try another time. Let's go up higher. Maybe you can see more people on this ledge up here. And then, then maybe you'll be uh, able to curse everybody. Uh, and the frustration grows until we come to a big confrontation at the end where the king is just so mad that he struck his hands together. I don't even know. That's, that's probably something, um, you know terrifying for a king to do. I don't know. But the point is, he was furious. He was furious at Balaam. And I just think of what would a lesser man have done? 
I can just imagine, can you imagine like uh, uh, somebody who was going to like succumb to the pressure of a king? Because you got to imagine, this is a very powerful king. A powerful king with all kinds of resources, with all kinds of people that are there with him. You know, like in those mobster movies when the mobster's surrounded by all his goons with all their guns and stuff. Like, it, you know, you walk into that, it's like, it's a little bit scary. You could you, you could be shot real quick, you know, and this is the same kind of situation. Like here is Balaam walking in with his donkey, you know, and all these people with swords and, you know, and all these uh, 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 you know, hired goons or assassins. Everybody's there and they're all trying to please the king. And now the king is angry because you're not doing the job he hired you to do. It's just scary. I think that um, I think a lesser man would have been like, you know, OK. I can't really curse Israel, but maybe I can just fake curse them and then I can take my reward and get out of here. Like, you know what I mean? Like, you know, you walk up and, and a person would have been like, oh, okay, I know I've met with God and there's a scary angel that told me I can't do anything but what God tells me to do, but maybe I can just, you know, do a quick abracadabra and like, oh, okay, you know, all right, um, curses on everybody, okay, bye, and and just kind of fake it and then get out of there, uh, right? But Balaam, um, uh, Balaam, just stands stands up to him and it's like, listen, I, I can't do I can't do anything about this, even though the king is mad. So I just I just wanted to tell you, first of all, I love that Balaam followed God's instructions all the way through. Like he he followed them even when it hurt. Even when he knew like he, and this is, a, think about it, it's a multi-day like experience here. He had to travel far. He had to, you know, do all of this divination stuff and, and keep meeting with God. I mean, this is, this is not something he did in like an hour. This is a, this is a big deal. And so he took all this time. He's not getting rewarded for it, and and but he still is. He's he's standing up under the pressure from a powerful king, and Balaam is following God even when it hurt. I just love that, and I just thought as I'm thinking about how how strong Balaam is to do that. You know, a strength of character to to keep following God even when you got all these external pressures telling you don't. So I think we, we are there sometimes, you know, we have a lot of external pressures that are like, listen, you have to do this. And if you say this, this person won't be your friend anymore. And what if you, what, what are people going to think of you if you do this? And we have all these weird external pressures and well, you're not going to make any money if you don't blah, 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 blah. And then, you know, you'll never, uh, you'll never get a promotion unless you, you know, and, and we think of all these, you know, external uh, pressures and, and, and people that put pressure on us and, you know, do we stay strong and true to what God has called us to do, even when we have all those pressures, um, even when it even when it hurts us, maybe financially, or hurts us with our our reputation, or hurts us with our um, job? You know, do we follow God? What does it take? Here's a question: What does it take for us to follow God in difficult circumstances? You know, I don't think any of us are gonna have a meeting with a giant angel on a, on a, uh, on the Victory Boulevard, you know, or Buena Vista. I don't think anyone's, you know, we're going to have a, our cars talk to us, <laughs> you know. Um, you know, Balaam was visited by an angel. He, he met with God in seeking. And he met with God alone, right? Uh, he, he, what would it take for us, though? What does it take for us to follow God in difficult circumstances? Do we follow God in difficult circumstances? Or do we crumble to that exterior pressure? These are just things that I've been thinking about. I, I really want, I want you to think about them as well. Um, I think about, uh, as I think about this word, you know, like pain or discomfort, as I think about, you know, Balaam following God, even when it, caused him discomfort uh, or when when it was painful um, I think about this principle that I've learned in in my orange theory fitness gym I don't know if I've talked about you, that with you before I, I sure I have I talk about it with everybody oh <laughs> one of those people um, that orange theory fitness one of the things that they they have like on the wall of their gym and they talk about is that there's no growth unless there's pain 
And, and I don't think they actually use the word pain because, you know, pain can be a bad thing in, in exercise, right? Uh, I think they use uh, the word discomfort or uncomfortable because um, the orange theory is that if you spend 12 minutes of a 60 minute exercise uh, workout um, in the orange zone, which is the zone that you are uncomfortable in, if you spend 12 minutes in that orange zone, then you achieve the afterburn, your metabolism is a little higher for the next 24 to 36 hours and burns 10 to 15 percent more calories than normal that's the orange theory so um the point the point is like in the uncomfortable zone that's where the most growth occurs that's where your muscles are you know getting stronger that's where you are getting faster. That's where you, you know, uh, when you when you are pushing yourself in that uncomfortable zone, that's where the most growth occurs. So obviously I didn't get the quote exactly right. But anyways, um, as I apply that uh, to life, I found the same to be true. You know, when things are just steady, uh, you know, and, and there's, there's really not often growth to a person or to your craft or to your skills. It's when you are challenged, it's when you're pushing yourself, okay? That's where growth occurs. And, and that happens to us often in difficult circumstances. We, um, we grow in difficult circumstances because that's when we are most often turning to the Lord and saying, God help me, I can't do this on my own. And that's, which is where we need to be every day, right? You know, God help me, I can't do this on my own. That's true of every single day. Sometimes we wander away from that notion and we decide, oh, I am strong enough to do it on my own. And then, you know, God slaps us back and says, no, you're not, you know, uh, thankfully. And he keeps us on our knees and humble and, and, and helps us to remember that without him, we are nothing. So I think my big question for you is, <clears throat> as we think, to we're coming up on almost a year of pandemic okay and like we're 11 plus right 11 and a half months or so um and there has been a great deal of pain and discomfort in this last year okay it's and maybe the metaphor is not exactly the same as the whole you know pain and growth in, in times of discomfort for like orange theory but um there have been a lot of times uh, uh, pain. There have been a lot of uncomfortable times and, and um, difficult circumstances this year, right? Amen, okay? And I think my question for you is, have you grown this year? How has God stretched you and built you up and grown you and molded you and shaped you into a new person? How, how has God done that in your life this year? Has he done that? Have you allowed him to grow you and change you and mold you and shape you this year? Or have you grown bitter? Have you grown angry? Have you um, allowed God to use this? Have you, have you allowed you? No, not allowed God. Have you... Um, allowed circumstances to separate you from your your fellowship from your fellow believers in Christ from your fellow disciples okay with your brothers and sisters in, in Christ have you allowed the circumstances to separate you and grown angry and bitter about it or have you taken steps and effort and and this pain and discomfort of this year and allowed God to grow you because um the most growth happens through discomfort. I just had I just I just had spent some time thinking about what God has done uh, in me this last year. He's, he's done some amazing things for me personally and for uh, for our choir ministry at church and and um, he's done some amazing things. Uh, but I'll tell you that I have been you know, on my knees praying and seeking the Lord every single day about it. Uh, I, 
and not not a t I'm not tooting my own horn here. Please don't misunderstand me. I, I am telling you that uh, I have experienced a great deal of pain and discomfort this year, and uh, it has definitely driven me to my knees in prayer to say, God, what are you doing? Like, what are you doing, Lord? You know, what is the next thing? What is happening? You know today and what am I to do tomorrow? You know, where is this ministry going? Where is, um, you know, in this pandemic? Because holy cow, you know, what are we to do uh, in our worship ministry as a church? What are we doing here in this and that kind of thing? You know, I just, I really have been seeking the Lord and, and, and he has grown me and um, allowed me to, he has shaped me and molded me. And uh, I've just learned a lot of awesome things. I really cherish these times of, uh, of devotions with you because it really forces me to, to get into this scripture like deeply and to be uh, uh, meditating on it day and night. It's been awesome. So I think my question I wanna leave you with is, is um, how have you grown this last year? If you, if you've, uh, and if you haven't experienced that, let's get on our knees and experience it together and ask God to grow us. Okay, have a great week. I'll see you next Monday.